Hi, beloved of the Lord. The message I have for you today, it's going to be a hard one. But I always, as hopefully you hear, give some good news because our world is not of this world. Our world is of heaven, the kingdom of God. Okay, so when you hear this message, I'm going to be talking about the future of the United States of America. I'm going to be talking about the key to the United States of America. I'm going to be talking about the people of the world in terms of this one thing that God told me that will influence all of us, regardless of whether you live in the U.S. or wherever part of the world we live. But I have a message that's going to be a strong part admonition, part encouragement. God spoke to me a word, and it is one of both admonishment and of encouragement. First, the admonition. The USA is dangerously on a course of implosion. And the encouraging word is this. If the people and the leaders of this country will follow God's word, he said, well, if they follow my word, they will be restored. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big differential, isn't it? One leads to basically destruction and the other leads to the uplifting and restoration. But we've come to a point where we are at that dividing line between what is ultimately leading to restoration and to the replenishment of what has been lost versus one that leads to destruction. And I won't go where that is intended by virtue of those who are kind of trending in that direction. But I will tell you this, and I've mentioned it before as I've spoken with you, that if you are a believer in Jesus as your Messiah, you're protected. That's right. You are protected because in this day and age where so many travails are happening throughout the world, God is pouring out of his, uh, the coffers of those who are unbelievers into the coffers of those who are believers. What do I mean by that? It's that there is a special bubble of protection, if you will, around God's beloved children. So even though you may see everything that seems to be chaotic around you and the world falling apart from God in its practice, know this, that you are indeed protected. And while all of this is going on, you are going to have a season of abundance. Okay, let's start with the admonition and that the USA is dangerously on this precipice of falling. I'm going to discuss the key understandings all of the people must understand to realize God's blessings. But first, I have a question for you. How many politicians in your area have referenced God in the public domain, in their speeches and their, and their uh, discussions publicly? How many in the course of elections have mentioned God, have mentioned the need for God, have even gone there to just reference God in any way, shape, or form? Not many, are there? Many are talking about ways to solve economic problems, ways to solve world problems, ways to solve your problems. But oftentimes they've not made mention of God. 
that's an indicator that's not healthy. It's an indicator actually of, of a disease that is in place in many areas around the world. You see, you can tell a, a healthy nation by its reference to God and its need as expressed by its leaders for God. But that's not happening in many circles, is it? Let's go to Second Chronicles 7.14 now because this is the key that your nation, your place where you live must follow. And of course, the United States of America, the leadership in order to realize God's blessings and not the other way around. Okay. The word of God says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Well, I, uh, I worked briefly for one of the presidents of the United States of America. I met him, uh, a number of times. I, in fact, went to his birthday party in Dixon, Illinois. I'll remember that the, the, the helicopters buzzing around and people talking amongst themselves. And it was in the high school of this president, the sitting president, as he was about to speak in his place of, uh, his hometown of Dixon, Illinois. His name, uh, was Ronald Reagan. And he put his hand when he was sworn in as president of the United States on the Bible, on this specific verse of second Chronicles seven fourteen. He knew what the restoration of America would call for. It was implicit within the words, the word of God that I just gave you. And the United States of America experienced a period of restoration from what was called at the time by the previous president, a malaise. There were gas lines. There were people who financially were struggling. And uh, there was that famous line in a debate with uh, Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter when uh, Ronald Reagan asked the question of whether uh, the people at that time were better off than they were before the prior administration. And that made all the difference in, in the election at the time, but, but it didn't really, because what made the difference ultimately was what following of the precepts in second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14 that I just read to you. It's, it's the formula for restoration of any nation or people in any place. Well, God told me this, and that is, it is time to get serious with God. Now, many of you who are watching or listening to this are serious. You're watching this because you're serious. But that doesn't necessarily apply overall. Atheism, beloved, and humanism are on the rise as the number of elected officials or members filling state and federal seats in the United States of America who profess no belief in God increased from only five before 2016 to upward of 70 after the most recent election cycle. That's a sharp shift from the Judeo-Christian values that have defined America since its founding. Now, by the, by the end of the 116th, or I'm sorry, 117th Congress, that's the Congress in place today, the 118th, will take place, maybe you're watching this in 2023, 
and that will be the 118th Congress. But the 117th Congress has only 80% of the members now who identify as Christians. That's 88%. That may seem like a high number to you, but it's low in comparison to previous times. And 8% of the sitting Congress identify with other religions or as other, quote-unquote. That's reflected in the Pew Research findings. As for the rest of America, the numbers show that more than 70% identify with the Christian faith. Nearly 6% with a non-Christian faith and a rapidly rising 22% in the quote-unquote religious nuns category. Now, it was only about a decade ago, or a little over a decade ago, that that number was not 88%, it was 95%. In fact, there was a, there was a publication in Time magazine uh, almost two decades ago that showed that, that the vast majority of people in the U.S., almost, almost 100%, uh, call themselves Christians. But that's not the case today. Now, in the uh, United Kingdom, which I referenced in a previous message in the historical context of the UK and, and Rome and, and Israel and uh, other places, Christianity in the UK has become a minority religion with a third of people now falling into the quote-unquote religious nuns category, the category for those who aren't religious or don't profess to be religious at all. Now, as for America, uh, there is a a quote by an individual who says that humanity follows the well-worn cycle that repeats itself. Indeed, I've looked and read through uh, a number of publications that have showed the degradation of societies as as a whole by virtue of uh, the first generation, such as the Depression era generation, my father's generation in the United States, who really were kind of had had fought for something that was good, righteous, World War II, of course. And then uh, societies like in Rome and other places and Egypt throughout the course of history, subsequent generations to the generation that has adhered to God, godly principles, and the righteousness of God's truth, that first generation who has adhered to that, which has been relatively, well, let's say not poor perhaps, but struggling financially, have, have then, uh, taken their personal wealth to the next level, if this makes sense to you, hopefully, and that takes it to the next level. And then they become the first generation to kind of get out of a position of almost poverty or of struggling. And then that is a generation uh, that, that lives according to the righteous, uh, uh, the righteous uh, dictates or righteousness of God in what he, he tells us to do. And then the subsequent generations then digress from there. And we have had now from what's commonly called the greatest generation in America to uh, the second generation, my generation, to the generation after that, and, and subsequently two generations after that, uh, that now are um, kind of edging away from God. And that's a dangerous trend. But it's not a trend that is unique in the course of modern history, at least. Now, we see that the nation of Israel has gone, that the nation of Israel has gone through this dozens of times through the Old Testament. Dozens of times. There's been the time of David, and, uh, and the wealth of Solomon, which is renowned, his wealth was one of the greatest times of wealth in all of history in Israel. 
and the adherence to uh, God and godly principles. We've seen it go through Israel, through the Old Testament, where they have brief moments of prosperity because of their obedience to God, and then they get comfortable with their prosperity, and they end up rebelling, rejecting God, and suffering the consequences of that. We're seeing it now in the United States of America and also in other parts of the globe where uh, nations and peoples have fallen away from God. It's trending downward. And in the United States of America, we're going through now a current uh, time of struggling uh, energy-wise, economically, and so forth. Now, I have a question for you that we'll try to answer. Are the American people... Are they truly descended from ancient Israel? Now, that's a question, isn't it? Because our descendancy from ancient Israel is something that is important to understand or at least know as to the blessing of the United States of America and the people in our nation. Uh, Let's talk about the founding of the United States of America and how uh, briefly I'll mention that there were 10 tribes uh, in the time of uh, ancient Israel, or uh, in the time after Moses and in the time when the Jews, bef- after he had passed, and, uh, and then uh, Joshua came in, uh, in a number of years they had claimed uh, Israel, and they had lived in accordance with God's uh, law. And there was, there was a period of time then where they had, were established, and then the Babylonian Empire conquered them. As we've talked about before, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The Jewish people were dispersed. And there was a, a period in the time that's referenced in the Bible where there were uh, four tribes that remained in Israel, and ten were dispor- dispersed throughout the globe. So they were dispersed in different places, in Asia and in Europe and the different continents. So there were tribes all throughout the world from uh, from Israel intermixed within the people that were present in those places. Okay, let's look at the first founding. We'll get back to how this ties in to the United States of America today based on how it was founded uh, in its uh, origins at the time of the per- first permanent English settlement in which is now the United States of America, which was in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. A few years later, the Pilgrims landed then in Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. Now, because of its combination of agricultural and mineral wealth in the U.S., which is still present today, America was destined to lead the world in per capita wealth. Now, some of the people who came founding the United States of America were coming because of religious persecution, as I mentioned previously, and some of them had entered into the United States of America coming from some of those other tribes, those 10 tribes, which were dispersed throughout the world. And then, uh, some are, are living currently in the U S and other parts of the world. Now, because of its combination of all of this wealth, whether in grain or cattle and coal, iron, petroleum production, America has had matchless bounty. It's become or had become the wealthiest nation in all of history in looking at wealth per capita and its resources as well. As an example, uh, during World War II, the East Texas oil field alone produced more, more oil than the combined production of all the Axis powers. Now, the prophecy of aged Israel to his grandson, Manasseh, Manasseh, excuse me, that his descendants would become the greatest single nation has certainly been fulfilled in the United States of America. That was a prophecy given in ancient Israel 
to the grandson of Manasseh. It was Manasseh's promise, and we believe, certainly I believe, that that was fulfilled in the United States of America, which we've talked about, was founded on the Bible. Okay, let's move on now and talk about how this applies to the United States of America. As United, the United States expanded westward, and you see a map now of how the United States became the United States of America, and that there were purchases, acquisitions, cascading throughout the U.S. from east to west. Originally, California, where I live, was not a part of the United States of America. And of course, there are 50 states now comprising the U.S. I won't get into an in-depth study of the history of the U.S. at now at this point. I will say this, that sadly, the American and many of the British descendants who uh, came from Britain, many of them fleeing religious persecution, who came to America have forgotten their God. And whose direct warning to those for those forgetful nations have thundered down through time in accordance with Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 19, which says this, then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. That's the consequence of falling away from God. From that early founding of the United States, when all of the founders, the original founders of the U.S. adhered to the Bible and declared the Bible as being the authoritative word for the United States of America, and each of those founders of the United States had declared as such to now, as I mentioned before, no mention of God, no mention of God for most of the leaders who, who talk publicly. That's how far we've gone because God was declared and referenced numerous times times in the early part of U.S. history, certainly in its founding. Okay, yet yeah, before this prophesied time of peace that was prophesied by the peoples of the United States and Great Britain who came over to the U.S., it will have been ter- they, there was a prophecy that, the, that, the, that those who had fallen away from God will endure, would endure a time of great trial. And God's punishment on these nations would come swiftly and amaze the whole world. Now, only those who have turned fully to God will be spared. This is, I'm um, speaking prophetically now from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 24 through 32, such that only those who have turned fully to God will be spared and the nations will be shaken and moved to a genuine repentance and a return to God unprecedented unprecedented in modern times. This is a prophetic word from the book of Ezekiel, and it is for our time. So there must be a turning away and a repentance from our evil ways and a turning toward God. And if you, uh, if you know of a public official, whether in the U.S. or your nation, encourage them to, uh, to, to dive deep and, and, and pray and seek the truth and turning, as in se- it says in Second Chronicles 7, 14, from their wicked ways and turning their heart toward God and repentance and toward his word. Okay, I have a word of encouragement that comes directly from the Bible, and this is for you. Now that we've uh, talked about the, uh, what will be or has been uh, the admonition, let's look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, which says this, Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's God's word for you today. That's the encouragement. He is with you wherever you go. Even in the midst of the storm, he is with you. He will not abandon you or if you are indeed in him are called according to his purpose. That is, you have confessed him as your Lord and Savior, having repented of your sins and received a free gift he has given by sacrificing himself, Jesus, on the cross. If that's you, that word's for you. Now, there's a key word that God gave me. It's a key word for you. It's a key word for any of you who are watching this or listening to this message. And that word is regeneration. Regeneration is the word for today. Now, what, another word for regeneration is rebirth. Now, this is the key, beloved, for what must happen in order for the United States of America and all nations, all people, to realize the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is destined to occur. It is happening in some circles today and will happen on a global scale. And I mentioned before in a previous message about the historical context of how it will happen. But let's move on to regeneration, which is the word of the day. It relates to the biblical phrase for what many have heard as being quote unquote born again. Now our rebirth is distinguished from our first birth when we were conceived and then born into uh, this world and inherited well, we inherited um, a sin nature. The sin nature is, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, when my uh, grandson was born, he just was a pure, seemed pure of heart. He had not experienced the world, not been affected by it. But uh, the other day, uh, I, was, he, I have some, uh, some medicine. I use what's called a nebulizer, and I have... Uh, these, uh, basically these tubes that I put in the nebulizer to help me breathe. Uh, and I told him not to reach in and get those tubes. And he immediately reached in and got those tubes. He was testing me. <laughs> he was already, he was already sinning and that he had already, uh, defied what I had told him to do. It was wrong. He knew it was wrong, but he wanted to test, uh, his limits. That's, that's called sin. It enters in at, uh, in an early age. Uh, so I prayed over him. I pled, pled, the, bleed of, uh, pled the, bleed, the blood of Jesus Christ, excuse me, and I have claimed him for Jesus. So I know what his future holds, but again, that is the first birth, and then, which is the selling of our innocence, as we grow older, the new birth, however, is spiritual. It's holy. It's a heavenly rebirth that results in our being made alive spiritually. And then when we go to heaven, we will be released of this body. Our born again spirit, which has been enlivened, that is given life by Jesus, will then be released into heaven. Now, before that born again state, we are what the Bible references as dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, our spirit is not alive. It is truly dead. You may ask, well, what about people who are not in Christ? Who are not in Christ, that is, maybe they're militant uh, atheists, as our, our friend Brian Melvin was before he entered into ha to hell. Well, if the spirit's dead, then, uh, and, and we have life everlasting, whether in heaven or hell, uh, then how, how does one live in hell, for example? We know people in heaven live with both their spirit, having dominion over their soul, 
But the people in hell, as Brian Melvin and others have testified, uh, go there only with their soul. They don't go with their spirit because the spirit can only live with Christ. So they live with their soul and the soul reminds us, it's the animating part of us, reminds us of past, present, and reminding us of what we've done wrong until when we get to heaven, when the spirit reigns over the soul and there is no memory of what's wrong. In hell, very, very sadly, uh, there is a constant reminder of what we have done and done wrong. So we need to be reborn as Jesus talked to Nicodemus about. Nicodemus said, how do I enter the kingdom of God? Jesus said, unless you're born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. He was talking about a new birth, and that was where we got the term born again. Now, that is referenced in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Our spiritual rebirth or birth results in a new person, beloved, entering heaven, a heavenly realm as expressed in Ephesians 2, 1. Now, why is this important based on what I talked about earlier? It's important because unless we understand regeneration and what this means clearly, then, uh, then we will not have the hope of Jesus Christ, either for ourselves or for the place in which we live, because we need to get clear on what regeneration is, because we cannot expect the regeneration of our nation, such as the United States of America, or wherever we happen to live, until we understand that regeneration begins with us. Now, Christ is formed in our hearts when we become reborn, so that we can become partakers of the divine nature. This is in Second Corinth. Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 having been made new creatures so new creatures means we're new the old has passed away we are made new through Christ and his redemption for what he did on the cross this is very important to grasp let's go on to John chapter 3 verse 6 where it says Gen regeneration is not optional it's not something we can decide, well, maybe I'll do it tomorrow or, or next hour, whatever. No, it doesn't work that way because it says in God's word that for flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. That's when we have new life or a new creation and that new life, which can transcend in a different form for where we live is a new life, what we call revival. Revival is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a place because those who are regenerated through Christ then pray as new creations, pray for revival in their land, bringing a newness into where they live. Now, regeneration is part of God, of what God does for us at the moment of salvation. But this is important to understand. It is along with sealing us in Christ, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. And adoption, as it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. And reconciliation, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. So we are sealed. We are adopted by Christ. We are adopted through the spirit of Christ. We become adopted and reconciled before God so that when we go before uh, Jesus and the throne of God, we will indeed uh, enter in through the gates of heaven or into heaven because Jesus has paid the price for us. We will not be judged we have already been judged and found not guilty by virtue of his reconciliation. Now, regeneration, beloved of the Lord, is God's making a person spiritually alive as a result of our faith in Jesus Christ. If you'd like a deeper dive into this, please subscribe to our newsletter because I have an article coming out for our December edition 
and if you're watching this after December, you can go back to uh, and subscribe for our newsletters and go back and read this. And I get into a very deep dive into scripture, scripture about regeneration and being sealed in Christ. Because a lot of you have had questions about can you lose your salvation? Well, the quick answer to that is no. And I explained that in depth in that article. So, beloved of the Lord, the result of regeneration is peace with God. As it says, as you see on your, uh, on your screen, Romans 5, one chapter or verse one and a new life as it says in titus 3 5 and second corinthians five seventeen, and it gives us eternal sonship as it says in john 1 12 through 13 and galatians three twenty six. so that regeneration begins the process of sanctification wherein we become the people God wants us to be, as it says in Romans 8, 28 through 30. This is very important for those who, who ascribe to uh, a work of, of, um, of salvation through good deeds. That's clearly not the case is in God's word. Clearly what he is saying is that sanctification is the walk in Christ, that is maturing in Christ, becoming more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Salvation is when we become born anew through Christ because of what he did on the cross. It's a very important distinction. And I'll wrap this up by uh, referencing uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and bring it back home to what is happening in the United States of America that will have an effect on the world because what happens in the U.S. does have an effect in the world, certainly the free world. And that verse in Romans says this, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. So that means that no works of the law, that as, uh, in other words, if I just try to be a good person, if I just try to uh, follow the Ten Commandments, because remember, Jesus talked to the rich young ruler who, who uh, wanted to follow after Christ, that is, he wanted to know that he was going to be uh, adopted into the kingdom of God. So that rich young ruler said, uh, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, well, um, you know, follow the Ten Commandments. And uh, he, and the rich young ruler said, I've followed them faithfully. I've, I've done all of that. I'm, I'm a good man, he basically, he said. And Jesus said to him, no one is good but God. So by his own, of his own righteousness and trying to follow the Ten Commandments, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't right, made righteous. So Jesus told the rich young ruler, well, just drop everything that you have where you live and follow me. And the rich young ruler was saddened because he knew he was beholden to his riches and therefore could not leave those to follow Jesus. Now, back to the United States, the riches. The United States of America is like that rich young ruler. The United States of America is wealthy uh, by any standard, but many of its people are not wealthy. That is, uh, the United States of America has uh, roughly, I think, over $300 trillion in uh, assets. That's a lot. And uh, in debt, it's, it's um, less than, I think it's less than $200 trillion. So that makes the U.S. Uh, still the wealthiest nation uh, in the world. I know China is trying to catch up, and China has a great deal of wealth, but um, they, have a, they don't have nearly um, the wealth of the U.S. now. But the wealth of the, of the U.S. is trending downward because our debt, when the debt exceeds the wealth net assets of, of the United States or any nation, then it becomes uh, impoverished. That is, it owes more than it has. And we've seen that. We've seen nations who have struggled. We've seen nations who have been empires who have then suffered tremendously and uh, become impoverished uh, where they are. So the trend line doesn't look particularly good for the U.S., 
where it's going and that many are have abandoned God and the faith in Christ. But the good news is that we can be regenerated. But here's the key. The regeneration starts with yours truly, with you and me. Our regeneration is entrusting in God, in living a life of faith, in understanding our, what the grace of God is in through our regeneration that empowers us with the Holy Spirit and not, as I mentioned in a prior message, not continually questioning our faith because we know that we are sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ as his word has confirmed, as, a, as I've noted to you. But instead, we go forward in the confidence of our salvation and that we not accept anything less than an adherence to God's word and for the restoration of the United States of America is predicated on Second Chronicles 7.14, as we talked about earlier. We are in need of repentance in this land. Well... I won't say more than ever before because every every peoples of every people of the world needs to repent but uh, we need to have a true repentance but it starts with acknowledging God acknowledging God's authority and and acknowledging the need for God where we live and if that doesn't happen if our public officials Let's say uh, they may talk a good, good, good story, but if they don't follow God and repent, acknowledge God, the God of Jesus Christ, and our need for God's authority, then there's not much hope. But the hope is not predicated on where you live. It's who you are, because that's really the bottom line. Are you regenerated? Are you living a life of victory? Because God is looking over your life. God is resting his faithfulness over you. God is isolating you from the ways of the world so that you can turn to him and that you can realize even God's outpouring of blessings in your life even though it seems like the world around you is caving in. That's because you're special. That's because you're called apart. That's because God favors you. That's because whatever happens where you live and however naughty (laughs) the, the government officials or rulers or politicians are where you live, you're really ruler. You're king of kings or lord of lords your president of presidents or whatever is god the god of jesus christ take joy beloved because in the midst of the storm and we are heading to a storm in the midst of it you are going to realize your blessings God is pouring forth blessings upon you. And you should take heart in that. Pray for your nation. Pray for the United States of America. Pray that we might turn from our wicked ways, as it says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, and follow after Christ. Pray for your nation for your world, for your community. And if you do that, well, and you are in Christ, I have great news for you. Be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless.